Now, when meeting the President of the United States, and if I say anything wrong tonight, you can talk to Brother Billy Powers. He told me he'd, I could throw him under the bus tonight. So it, it, when you're meeting the President of the United States, uh, protocol dictates certain things happen. Uh, as I understand it, if you're seated and the President walks in, you are to stand up. That's my understanding. And uh, as soon as he enters the room, the President should be normally addressed as uh, President in his last name, like President Obama, or Mr. President, one of the two. And, uh, and I guess in the future, if, if, that, if and when, I don't know if if and when is appropriate, but if and when we have a female President, as I understand it, it'll be Madam President. And uh, right now, uh, Donald Trump is not President yet, but it is appropriate to refer to him as President-elect Donald Trump. I think that's the way you do that. Uh, all United States presidents, after they are president, still retain that title for life. And so it's always appropriate to refer to uh, any former president at, you can say former president, but it's also appropriate to say Mr. President or president in their last name. So it'll always be appropriate to refer to uh, Mr. Obama as President Obama. That will be appropriate for the rest of his life. Uh, when meeting the Queen of England, it's a little different, but not a lot different. Uh, men are generally expected to bow, but you just kind of tilt the head as a man. Uh, women, if they curtsy, it's a little bitty thing now. They don't go all the way down anymore. It's just a little kind of that kind of thing. But uh, you don't have to do that. You can shake hands, but you're to wait for them or her to offer her hand first. You're not supposed to just reach out and grab her around the neck. Uh, when you are presented, and that's the way they refer to it, when you are presented to the queen, uh, you're to uh, give a formal address like your majesty, and then subsequently you're to say ma'am, whereas if you meet the president, you can say Mr. President, and then after that you call him sir. In her case, you say ma'am, which is pronounced like jam, so, okay. But uh, for male members of the royal family who aren't the queen or the king, you're still supposed to refer to them as your royal highness, and then subsequently sir or ma'am, uh, whether it's male or female. Meeting someone big requires a certain amount of preparation and a certain attitude. Tonight I'm really talking about meeting God, and there is no one higher. You can't meet anyone higher. Now, most of you know that dove story of mine, but you know, that's just an encounter. I think we all have encounters with God. And I think you're to have them on a regular basis. And one of the ways, obviously, is when we're here. Like right now. We may, in the hustle and bustle of it, kind of lose the idea that we're actually in an encounter with God right now. But there are moments of powerful encounters that you have. That you kind of stand in awe. That you know you've come into His presence. And there are some surprising places that you can encounter God. And, and, and maybe you, you're not aware of this, but in ministry, one of the problems with ministry is it can be a source of profound emptiness. Um, you can get busy crafting sermons and lifting up Jesus and calling on folks and calling on folks to change and reminding them to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, and it can become a job. And that's a real danger. And you can end up talking more about God than you're talking to God. Uh, you end up like a travel agent telling you ought to go to Hawaii and you've never been. Um, so you've got to really want desperately to draw closer to God and learn to encounter God where you can. If you really believe that you can encounter a God who shows up in floating axe heads and 
talking donkeys and water flowing out of rocks in the desert, then you've got to believe that he's kind of the God of the unexpected, that those weren't the kind of things they were looking for. So looking for God, let me suggest to you that you look for him in the unexpected moments. And that way, you're looking for him, but in a different way, you're like, oh, that's God. Uh, and so there are several things I, I might suggest. I, I was reading an article and I thought it was really good. One of the places you might encounter God is in silence. We, in the Western culture, we tend to think we've got to be singing a song or you've got to be saying a prayer or having a Bible study or hearing a sermon that you're going to encounter God in that kind of environment. But one of the best places, believe it or not, is in solitude and silence when no one's around, when you're not saying anything. If you can find those moments, God often shows up and will take you off guard almost in a moment where no one else is around. Mother Teresa said this, we need to find God and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. I think she's right. It may be you could take that too far, but I think that's a good thought. Another place you can find him is in waiting. You know, a lot of our lives spent waiting. We, we tend to think our life is spent doing something. We're going to do something, but a lot of it's in between doing something and going to do something. It's spent, and there's a lot more space in between than in the actual other. And so waiting, uh, you may feel stuck in between, but it's often when we're stuck in between and we think nothing's happening that God's doing some of his best work in that in-between time. The psalmist said, my soul waits in silence for God. And then Isaiah said, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So there is a blessing in that space between. When God hasn't showed up yet, you're praying for God to do something, and he hasn't showed up to the rescue yet. The cavalry hasn't come over the hill yet. That time that nothing seems to be happening is actually a blessed time of an encounter with God. But we don't tend to think of it that way because actually you're, you're probably growing more right then when you're hanging on and yet nothing's happened yet than you are when things are bouncing off the wall, God's doing something. Another one is absence. When you don't have what you need, God often shows up in the not having what you need. Uh, you, maybe you're praying and, and God's not responding and, and you need something and, and it feels like God's just beyond your fingertips and it feels difficult maybe to even pray. You're, you're having a difficulty even saying anything and you go through kind of a spiritual darkness where you feel almost as if God has left you and believe it or not, those times when you feel like God's left you Maybe, and it sounds strange, one of the most blessed times of an encounter with God than you can imagine because he will one day show up. And it's that vacuum of the absence that makes his appearance so wonderful. And it's so good when he shows up to the rescue for you. So absence is actually an encounter with God. And then another one, believe it or not, is sacrilege. That's one sounds strange. But there's so much sacrilege in our world today. So many people that's disrespectful that are irreverent toward God. And you think, well, oh, I don't even want to be here when I'm hearing some of the stuff that you hear. But sometimes in the mocking and the... Uh, the feeling of this uh, pseudo-righteousness of the culture when they're talking bad about us Christians and saying really bad things, if you will listen, you might actually hear the word of God in this sense. You know, sometimes we do need the finger pointed at us. Sometimes we really do need to repent. Sometimes we do need to hear. It's kind of like the little child that said, Oh, look, the emperor has no clothes on. Well, it embarrassed everybody. Nobody liked it. 
but it was a good thing to say, right? So even though the way it might be done would be horrible and none of us would feel good about it, it might expose something in me about my walk with God that needs to be corrected. So sometimes, believe it or not, a sacrilegious moment can find uh, God in that moment. There's nothing so secular that it cannot be sacred. And that's one of the deepest messages of the incarnation that's kind of hard to get. Let me, I'm, I'm staggering here. Let me move along here just a little bit. Um, God made the first move and he sought after us. We, we didn't make that move. First uh, Chronicles 28, 9 says, The Lord searches all hearts. He's doing that. And understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. you and, he, and you say, well, God's always present. Well, he was always present then. So what does he mean? If there's no special finding of him, encounter of him, that verse has no meaning. If you think this is the whole of the encounter with God and there is no real encounter, well, then that verse has no meaning. But if you believe there is, are special encounters with God, then suddenly that verse has other meanings. And then Song of Solomon 2 and verse 9, I love this. My beloved, and by the way, I don't agree. This is going to sound strange, but I mean, I don't totally agree. Let me put it that way because it sounds typically pompous and arrogant what I just said, but... I don't totally agree with the way that the Song of Solomon has been interpreted. I don't really think it's about a marriage as it's been commonly interpreted. I think the old way of interpreting it is probably more closely correct than the more modern way of ter interpreting it. In that case, my beloved is looking through the windows in Song of Solomon 2 and verse 9. Then that becomes God looking at you, searching for you, and the love he wants to ignite in you. And that makes the book different. And I lean that way. John 4, verse 23, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He didn't say we're seeking. You know, that's pretty neat. Now, if my car, if I went outside and my car was out of gas, you would not be shocked at all if you heard me say, I got to go find a gas station and get gas, right? But if I said, there's a gas station searching for me, that would be shocking. The gas station has been searching for you. It's more profound than we can imagine. God is moving toward us. Luke 19, verse 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God came here, all the way from there, to here looking for you. He had already been seeking in the Old Testament, and then he came all the way here to try to find us. Another thought is that we need, since God is making that first step and seeking us, we need to learn to seek the God that's seeking us, don't we? We need to learn to seek that encounter. He's seeking encounters with us. We think all he's seeking is a recognition on a pure theological, intellectual level. You know, that's all we have to have is believe the right things. But if he's really seeking encounters with us and interaction with us in the day-to-days of life, when we can just know he's there and working with us, if he's seeking that, how much more should we be motivated to seek him back, right? Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 29. You will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, I know that means theological, but it means so much more than that. It means a real encounter with a real God that's really active in this world. Matthew 7, 7. Ask it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, if you seek God, you will find him. And you will encounter him in ways that you don't expect. And it will surprise you. I love Philippians 3, 7 through 14. Let me just run through a little bit of that. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Why? 
Yea, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I'd throw everything away if I could know Jesus a little better. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. If I could just really know him. Now he knew Christ. But he's saying, oh, I want to know him even more. Now Paul doesn't know him by this point. Who am I? Verse 9, and, and to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him. Paul knows him. If he said he did not know him, he would be lying. But he's wanting something deeper. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being Conformed to his death. I'd like to die on a cross just like him. Wow. Verse 12. Not, and this is the really big thing. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I'm searching for him like he searched for me. I want to get close to him because he wanted to get close to me. I want to be with him always because he said, I want to be with you always, even in the end of the age. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Oh, we all must admit that one. Amen. I am not apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, all those times we thought we were really good with God, and we knew God, and we searched God out, and we got close to it. I forget all of that. It doesn't do me any good. How current is your Christianity? How current is your encounter with God? What difference does it make if you were encountering God last week? Are you encountering Him right now? Are you with Him now? I do not count myself to have apprehended one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I think there's something more to be reached for with God. Amen. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's an incline. I can't get there and just stay there. You roll back down the hill. Now I know uh, that there are members whose marriage is perfect and their kids are all perfect. Right? Right. Don't they scare you? And I know that there are elders that agree with everybody and each other about everything and they never get frustrated and they just love each other. I just didn't run into that group yet. And, and I know that there are preachers that understand all mystery and all knowledge and all love and they're just good at everything. I'd sure like to meet them though. If Paul's struggling, I think we can struggle, don't you think? So I'm going to give you really quick, I know you're scared because I'm going to give you a bunch of things really quick, and we're going to run through them really quick because they're right there in the text. And there's not a lot of explanation with this. It's when we meet God, here's what I see happening with Moses, okay? Can I just run through it really quick? Uh, when we meet God, there is a captivation moment in Exodus 3. Let's start reading through. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now at this point, he doesn't know this is God. Verse 3, Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sign why the bush does not burn. He still doesn't know this is God. There is a captivating moment. There is a sound of a rushing mighty wind. There's something that God does to get your attention. There's something he does. And then you turn. God initiates that. How many times has there been a... And you paid no attention. There's a captivating moment. God is calling. He's doing something to try to get you to want to encounter him. Literally. But are we looking? Second little truth is when we meet God, there is a communication of sorts. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying 
that every time you get in God, you're hearing a voice or something like that. He does in this text. It says, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. I'm sorry. If a bush talks to me, I'm running. The, it's not here I am. It's here I go, you know. I'm not staying around. Right. That's what would happen to me. I'm just, just really, I've never had a bush talk to me. And... Uh, that I'd be gone. But what I'm suggesting is, is that God will give you a message. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to be like this, but I do believe that God gives you a nudge. Hey, you see that? Isn't that what you really need to be looking at? Isn't that what you do? I mean, we, we, let me put it this way. Do you believe the devil tempts you in your heart? Do you believe he, he gets you thinking things? Well, why wouldn't you believe God would do that? Right? So would God not nudge you along? Absolutely. Third thing is, is when we meet God, there is a caution. Look at the caution he gives, verse 5. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Which is a good scripture for wearing sandals to church, I think. But, I mean, it is Florida, right? Do not draw near. There, is, there should be a caution whenever we're around God, that we shouldn't be flippant. This is not a joking matter. I mean, when you, you're approaching God, there should be a reverence for it. And then number four, uh, when we meet God, there is a clarification. There needs to be an understanding that we're actually seeing God at work. Verse six, he says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He got it. This is God. And, and I think if you're going to encounter God, there's going to be a moment where you go, that was God. I remember when we just bought the land at, at the property and we didn't have any more money. Y'all may not know that. We didn't really have any money. And all of a sudden, a tax bill showed up. And all of a sudden, somebody showed up our door from the county that needed to run a pipe across our property. This all happened virtually simultaneously. And what they paid us to run that pipe across was almost to the penny what the tax bill was. Uh, you can say it's anything you want, but I know what it was. That was God. Okay, you need to recognize, you, and God makes it clear, this is me. I, I, this is really me here. And you'll know it. Amen. You'll know it if you're paying attention. And then number five, uh, when we meet God, there is a compassion. You will see the compassion of God because he'll still love you even though you're not doing all you ought to do. Uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because they're taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I'm going to deliver them, he goes on to say. I know how they feel. Let me tell you something. One of the things, when God shows up in your life, here's one message you ought to get. God knows what's going on in your life. That means he cares. When God shows up and does something in your life and you have an encounter moment, you know he cares. When the right amount of money drops out of the mailbox, you know he cares, amen? When things just work out, when you're praying and you're stuck in a different city and your car won't crank and you don't have money to fix your car to go home on, you ever been in this situation and you pray over the car? You ever done that? And the car cranks and it drove 400 miles home without a problem. You ever done that? Yeah. He cares. Whether you know it or not, he cares. And then when we meet God, there is a commission. God God doesn't just meet with us for no reason. He doesn't meet with us just to say, hey, bud, give me five. You know, it's not that. It's not like that. When God is going to encounter you, he's got a mission for you. He's got a commission for you. He's got something he really wants you to do, and that's the reason he's getting involved. So in verse 10, it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God when he's encountering you in the day-to-day, -day, in the providence, in, in moments of your life, he's doing that to get you to move from here to here, to do something. Hey, he's not just doing it just to be buddies. He's doing it trying to get a reaction out of you to get you to take on a greater task 
and to do something else. That's, that's what he's doing. And then finally, the last point, uh, when we meet God, there is a capitulation. At first, whenever you hear the, what God's wanting you to do, the first thing you do is, uh, I'm not ready for that right now. I don't want to do that. Uh, almost every time. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. But if you recognize it's God, even Moses, look at this, Exodus 3, verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, quite honestly, Moses, you're nobody and you can't do it. But verse 12 says, And he said, And I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I've sent you when, not if, when you have brought the people out and Egypt, you shall not, you maybe, you shall serve God on this mountain. It's going to happen. You just need to get your head around it. Okay? And so when we meet God, at some point, if you really know it's God, you will capitulate to the things he's pushing along in your life. It's hard to go there because we tend to want to just keep religion here at the superficial level and it be just a book learning and not having encounters with him in the providences of our life. But God's waiting because they had the book in these days and God met people in the providences of life. And you need to look for him. Uh, those are the seven things of what happens when at least Moses met him. When finding God, you need to understand that you end up finding God in here, within, and in the purpose he has for your life. And he'll change you forever. Do you want to meet God and encounter him within? Or do you want to show both? That kind of brings me to my last thought. Clovis Chapel used to tell a story about a century ago about two paddle boats on the Mississippi. They were, uh, they were taking supplies somewhere. And they were going along and... Uh, they got side by side and they were going rather slow and so the sailors on the one boat and the sailors on the other started chatting at each other. And they, they started saying, oh, your boat's not fast. And, oh, your boat's not fast. Well, then they got ugly about it, okay? It's like football almost. Well, your boat's no good and you can't go anywhere. So you know what happened? They started racing. Now, that, that's kind of fine if they had said, well, let's race to the tree down there. But they kept racing like going all the way to their destination. So they kept going. And because they were burning all their coal as fast as they could in their steam engines, it wasn't long until they burned all their coal up. Now they had enough coal to get to where they were going if they were running the normal speed. But when you run it as fast as you can and throw as much coal in it as you can, you can burn up all your coal. So they had burned up virtually all their coal. One started trip, drifting back now. And the other one still has a little more coal. It's going on ahead, you know, so it looks like they're going to win. And they're falling backward until the one young sailor comes up and he's got a box in his hand and he throws it in the fire. It's their product that they're shipping. And they found out it burned about as good as the coal. So the other one said, we're not going to be beaten. So they went back and got another box and another box. They won the race and lost their shipment. <clears throat> they lost what was within. And all I can say is, I think we're in a rat race. And it's all about getting there as fast as we can. And we're burning up what's on the inside. And we're not refueling, we're not taking in more of the Lord. All I can say is I, I really think we need to think more about what's within. If you need God, and who doesn't? You need to keep your cargo, and you need to worry about the cargo and an encounter with God and refueling a lot more than you need to worry about this rat race we're in. I, I would like to be able to tell you you can have both, but it's not my experience. My experience is it when I, when I get doing real good in this world, I'm usually doing really bad with God. And when I'm doing really good with God, I'm usually not doing really good in this world. So it's your call. But God would like, because He's seeking an encounter with you. He's seeking it when we worship. He's seeking it when we pray. 
He's seeking some special moments in your life. But you've got to look for them and you've got to seek Him. And He'll show up for you. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to the Lord, we want to give you that opportunity. This lesson hadn't been about that. But if you would receive this simple idea of Acts chapter 2, that those that gladly received His word were baptized. Why? Because He told them if the ones who believed would repent and be baptized, they would receive remission of sins, the Holy Spirit. That's the invitation in that day. It's the invitation to die as well. If you would receive it, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?